Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How are you? Okay. How are you? Uh, I, I am okay. It's raining. Uh, spirits in Westwood are depressed. Over the rain or something else? Over the basketball game. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to hear about that. Not that I watched it, but I'm still... Me the... either. <laughs> um, but but it's a sad, it is a sad, a sad week for UCLA. Um, I'm looking ahead to the Masters and hoping uh, Phil Mickelson will win, personally. That's where my sports consciousness is. Okay, well, that's because you're part of the golf-playing elite. Uh, wait a second. I played almost all my golf at municipal courses, Mickey, which is, and they, they are one of the great social mixers, one of the great social mixing yeah. institutions in America. Okay. You would love them. There's a lot of social equality there. Cool. Um, now, Mickey, the last thing I would ever do is accuse you of being literally obsessed with any issue, but I just uh, looked at your blog, and you seem to be literally obsessed with the issue of immigration. Um, well, this is the crunch week. I mean, I mean, this is the time to figure out what you want to do. So, Yeah, no, no, no. You, you it, think it, about it's, it now, it's a healthy or... obsession. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm glad you agree. But I have a question. Yeah. Uh, on this, there's a, there's a question that has emerged only recently, I think, and the first time I saw it clearly emerge was on Blogging Heads TV in a dialogue between Byron York and David Korn, and it is, is it really so clear uh, that, th that immigration is a bigger problem for Republicans than Democrats? That was kind of implicitly assumed for a while. Uh, do, you, do you think it's the case? No, of, uh, of course not. I think the Democratic Party is split, too. Uh, if you, you know, Senator Byron Dorgan has come out against the uh, the semi amnesty proposed by McCain and Kennedy on the grounds that it lowers wages for workers, and since Democrats are supposed to be the traditional party of workers and unions, yeah. uh, they have a lot to lose if a flood of low wage workers is let into the country. Well, so. both parties are split, but given the fact that it's a two party system, you've got to think in the end the issue is better for one party than the other. So. In a way, the question is which party is more evenly well, split. That's the party in the biggest trouble. Or, or more specifically, I guess you want to look at voters who care so much about this that they might actually Yeah, well, we have an deserve. election. It's a question of who wins the election. And I, I sort of tend to think in the, you know, it depends what the Republicans do. In, in, in the short term, if the Republicans uh, play to their base and, and get tough on immigration, I think they do quite well in the congressional elections coming up. Maybe less well in the long term is the you know that's this conventional wisdom is that they lose Latino votes over the long haul. I, I I'm sort of skeptical of that. But uh, so you're saying they didn't have enough Latino votes already tucked under their belt to really lose much of that? Well, no. Bush got a, a huge chunk of Latino like votes. Like 40 percent or something. Yeah. Well, that's a lot compared with his share of black votes, which is yet to reach the double digits, I believe. Okay, so, so they do lose Latino votes in the short run. The business community, on the other hand, kind of where are they going to go, right? Right, exactly. Um, for Democrats, right. you would think that it, the division is between, on the one hand, kind of Latino voters plus a certain number of kind of elite liberals, I think, right, who are ideologically ill-disposed to seem nativist. And then on the other side, you might have uh, working-class whites and blacks. Well, right, but I just don't think the way to see it is to look at which parties are split. The, the way no, to see it is split, to but, but in theory, who gets the most votes. In, well, well, no, in theory, the party, who, who, if, you, if you confine it to voters in each party who are really willing to desert on this issue, then the party who, who, who has the most even split among that block is in the biggest trouble. Because if you've got an 80-20 split, then you just, you just say sayonara to the 20%. And the other party's got a 50-50%, and they're in 50-50 split. They're in bigger trouble, right? There is, there is an answer to this question, whether we know it or not. No, 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 I understand. It's just I, I, the standard way to look at midterm congressional election, which may be the same thing that you're saying, is, you know, whose voters are most enthusiastic and whose voters are dispirited. And if, it seems to me that if the Republicans are the champions of border security, their voters will be enthusiastic. And the Democrats will be sort of all over the lot. Uh, so it's a shrewd strategy from the Republican point of view uh, to, to, to do that at the congressional level. Now, their problem is that they have a president who's not uh, sending out those signals. But this is you know, Bush's history. This, is, this isn't a vote about Bush anymore. No. Uh, so you're saying it actually helps the Republicans. That's my theory. Is that, is that, but that's know, not widely shared, is it? That's no, not widely said. That's because I'm, an, you're, you're I'm ahead I'm, of the curve. Or I'm a, a crazy fringe figure, but uh, 
the uh, you know, the, um, the Republicans have been desperately looking for some issue to galvanize their base. Is it going to be, you know, they're going to bring back gay marriage? Are they going to say Christianity is under attack? Is it, what's it going to be? Uh, and, and it was traditionally assumed that immigration wasn't that issue because Bush was sort of wishy-washy or centrist or moderate on immigration. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's true. It seems to me the Republicans, the Congress, congressional and Senate candidates can distinguish themselves from Bush and if they want to rally the base, they can rally the base. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think most people think I think that that theory is wrong. But th I've gotten a few emails from people who think it's right. Well, David Korn stressed the fact that the Republicans, for the time being, are the ones on the playing field. So it's kind of their problem, at least in the short term. You don't think that matters come election time, because in the end, it's one candidate against the other, and they both have to declare a position on this issue. Right, and you know, the, pre the media is obsessed with like embarrassing the Republicans on this issue. Republicans split, and they never, f they rarely focus on the Democratic split. I mean, we have Paul Krugman leaving the reservation, uh, saying that well, there, there are these problems for low wage workers. We have Byron Dorgan, uh, you know, leaving the reservation and saying, well, I, I'm not, I'm not for letting in all sorts of low wage workers. We have the the president of the AFL CIO saying he doesn't like the guest worker program. So there, you know, there are big problems uh, for Democrats. Yet, uh, I don't think you're going to see that many Democratic candidates be able to champion uh, the the border control or however you want to call it cause. Uh, because they also, you know, they want to embarrass the Republicans on this Latino issue. So they're, 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 so they're you know, I don't think, and their base isn't really going to be galvanized by this the way the Republican base is. Okay. Well, you heard it here first, I think. I thought I wrote it a week ago. Okay, you read it there first. But you heard <laughs> it here first. I didn't say you read it here first. Oh, you saw it. So you it heard first. it here yeah. first. Okay, cool. Um... There, there is one interesting issue that, with immigration that we should discuss, which is this proposed compromise that the Washington Post wrote about uh, in the Senate, where they basically say if you've been here five years, you get this semi-amnesty path to citizenship, and if you've been here less than five years, we're going to have employer sanctions that basically make it so uncomfortable for you to, find, to stay here and find work that you're going to have to leave. And you dissed that in your I, blog I did recently. not diss that. I reflected an open-minded uh, curiosity about whether this would actually work, because it seems to me the genius of this plan, you know, the, the problem with the semi-amnesty is not that you let in, uh, you, you give amnesty to a bunch of people who are already here. That's the, the, in itself, that's not a problem. The problem is you send a signal to people who might potentially be illegals in the future that, hey, if you come here, there'll probably be an amnesty for you down the road. It's a huge incentive, a magnet, to attract people. But if you actually also, you know, kick 40% of the people out of the country, and there are TV pictures of these people having to go back to Mexico because they can't find work here, uh, that's a huge disincentive that might count, you know, that might erase the incentive effect of giving a semi-amnesty. So it's possible that this weird compromise might have some merit to it. Uh, that's, I think, what I wrote. And, but there, you know, chances are that the sanctions won't work. We won't have the demonstration effect of kicking all these, kicking a bunch of people out. Uh, and you'll just have the Sydney amnesty giving a, a beacon clarion call saying, you know, come to America and get the next amnesty. Uh, but it might work. I mean, if employer sanctions work, you know, maybe that'll be the effect. It's worth exploring, I think. Okay. Well, I think it's up to me to rein in your obsession with this topic by shepherding us to the next one. Okay. Your uh, enthusiasm is infectious. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no, we just we argued we argued about the issue itself last time, and, and I, I don't know. I don't have I don't have any new thoughts. Okay, it's just the, it's the hot, it's hot hot hot. Hot hot hot. I feel the heat. Okay. I mean, the, okay, well, I have more to say, but... Well, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, everybody's... I'll, I'll just take, uh, everybody's, I'm 40 winks, okay, go ahead. Everybody's dumping on Frist for rushing this vote, okay, because they think he's pandering to the nativist wing of the Republican Party. But rushing the vote actually helps uh, the pro-immigration side, because right now there's a sort of press stampede to, to uh, you know, who can be, uh, you know... Uh, more appealing to the Latino vote, and there are all these demonstrations, and oh, let's fight the nativists, and so uh, 
the first, a rush vote is probably going to be a more pro-immigrant vote. The backlash hasn't had time to build. And second, Frist is in the perfect position now to sell out the nativists because he's denounced amnesty and he's sort of allied with them. And then if he can embrace a compromise, which he's actively pushing for, say, well, this isn't amnesty, this is okay. Uh, uh, and sort of uh, he has more credibility uh, to do that because he's previously allied himself with the the anti-immigration side. So it, it, it does seem to me that Frist is not, you know, is, is, if you look at it one way, is, 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 is sort of playing a, a, a perhaps inadvertently shrewd uh, pro-immigrant role here. Hmm. Contrary to what you read in the press. Well, if it's shrewd and it's Frist, I would think that it's inadvertent. He just seems so clumsy that but there may be method in his madness. Or... Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't, the answer is I don't know, but but you know it worked out with the judges. Everybody said he, he's an idiot. He's proposing this nuclear option. But hey, there are two conservative judges on the Supreme Court. It worked pretty well. That, that did work out. I'm not sure he envisioned the way it would work out, but 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 for the Republicans, right. it worked out. Yeah. Anyway, okay, I'll move on now. Okay. That would, uh, that would uh, be to swear. That would be to Iraq, where I'm going to chide you for chiding President Bush for his horrible interference in Iraq's affairs by urging Jafari to step down. Now it looks like, hey, we should have done that months ago. Now Jafari is thinking of stepping down. His own party has issued him a three-day ultimatum, one day of which has already passed. Uh, the, the general, uh, if you read the blogs this morning, the, the consensus is pretty bleak, but the consensus is that we should have had this forceful intervention from Bush uh, a few weeks ago, so, so you, you were wrong. Him? You were wrong in your reflexive anti-Bush, anti-Bushism. As well, usual. Actually, I said two things. I wondered whether uh, how much leverage Bush has, um, and it still isn't clear. I mean, Jafari hasn't actually uh, stepped down. Also, right. you know, it's it's less and less clear to me now whether or not Bush going public with his opposition to Jafari was actually intentional, or whether it was a leak by the opposition. Uh, to Jafari in Iraq, uh, in whom our ambassador had confided Bush's opposition, or what? It's, it's less clear whether it was intentional that Bush go public. In any event, it, it did seem to have the effect of, uh, of spurring the, the Shiite opposition to Jafari to go public. Right. That has happened. On the other hand, A, Jafari still hasn't stepped down. B, if he is, uh, if, if he does step out of the way, it may lead to something actually messier than what we've got now, which is an intra-Shiite split. I mean, one prediction I tentatively will make is that if he steps down, you won't see the previous his previous rival get the spot without al -Sad, without Muqtad al Sadr leaving the Shiite coalition. I don't think I think that he would have to swallow too much pride to accept the candidate he previously opposed. Remember, Sadr pushed Jafari over the top, and right. that's why uh, Jafari was beholden to Sadr. Sadr likes that. I, I don't think Sadr's going to sit there and let him let, let Jafari, A, step and, down, and B, accept the candidate that Sadr previously opposed. So if that guy stays, you're going to get, I think, a, a, a Shiite split. Now, now the, the other Shiites a, can pull it off terrible by, by siding with, with, by courting Sunnis and Kurds. Yeah, why is that such a terrible thing? If well, we because al Sadr is a little bit of a hothead, and he has quite a few guns at his disposal. It's just not clear that that, that, that is a better outcome, and there are, uh, there, there are people saying that that's uh, even messier. And in any event, in any event, there are two questions. I mean, should Bush do what he can to push Jafari out? Sure, fine. I didn't, I didn't raise that question. The second one is, should he go public about it? I still say that that was, was a mistake. It's not clear that that, that that was a prerequisite for having influence. But in any event, um, that sends the wrong picture to the world. You know, a lot of Muslims already think that we, we did this war not for democracy but for some other motivation. Well, this just shores up that belief. B, if al-Sadr does go into opposition, it, it's a political asset for him that Bush publicly opposed Jafari because he can style himself as the anti-occupation, the voice of the anti-occupation Shiites, and he will exploit that. Well, fact. well look, it, people are always complaining that the U.S. is interfering in, in their affairs. The Israelis complain that we're interfering in their affairs when we oppose Sharon. It's a crock when they do it, and it's a crock 
when the Muslims do Mickey, it. the question is whether we're it's a crock. It's actually say, not a crock in either case, but that's not the question We're anyway. allowed to say what we want. If, we give, if we're giving billions of dollars in aid to the country, we're allowed to say what we want, and we're allowed to withdraw our aid. We're independent actors. That's, that's Mickey, what we're allowed to do. Mickey, whether we're allowed to is so far from being the question I'm trying to address here, which is whether it serves our interests. Do you, do you get the distinction well, there? Well, obviously, but, but, but obviously it was the going public that has put the final pressure on Jafari, so it turned out to be not a crazy thing to do. Uh, and and, and it, 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 you know, the problem was that he didn't have the votes in a democratic system to uh, to get the position he wanted. And I, I, if you read Iraq the Mal today, he is fairly pessimistic about the ability to resolve this without some violence uh, with the Sadr forces, who, as you say, are, are in the process of being marginalized and think they're about to be attacked. And I repeat, will have been empowered by Bush going public on this, and I'm not the only one who said this. This was pretty much implied by an expert they had on uh, PBS NewsHour last well, but it, night. No, I'm not saying that Sadr probably has been slightly empowered, but it's not as if the opposite, the people who are, who are going to take over the Shiite coalition are pro-American. They're, they're very anti-American, too. So, I, 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 you know, Sadr has his people, and, and, you know, if he's backed himself into a corner where he doesn't have his Sunni allies, he doesn't have any Shiite allies, he just has his Mahdi army, uh, that well, might not be such a terrible Sauter situation. Sauter is a guy it's probably not in your interest to back into a corner, I'm not sure. But in any event, the uh, one thing this shows, you know, one thing you're hearing now is, well, this, this split among the Shiites has deep and historic roots. Uh, you know, people who know say that. It's just an example of another thing that I think the administration was oblivious to, I was oblivious to going in. It's just another testament to how little of the information we really needed that we actually had when, when, when we started this war. We were just kind of woefully under underinformed, and that probably should have made us a little more humble. Um, right, but it's not necessarily a bad thing that the Shiites just split. The previous worry was that the unified Shiites were going to beat up on the Sunnis. So well, it, it, it's conceivable that that, that that kind of civil war, you know, some Shiites plus some Sunnis against some Shiites plus some Sunnis, would be less likely to go regional. I don't know, but we're so far, at this point, you know, we're so far into the realm of the unknown. But, you know, one other example of how little, uh, the, the, the decreasing leverage of the Bush administration there is, you know, we've been trying to get the Interior Ministry to rein in uh, the militias. Uh, well, not only has it not done that, there's a, a piece in The Guardian within the last couple of days, I'll link to it, saying that the, the Interior Ministry for the last two or three months has been refusing to deploy the police that we have been training, you know, all those police who are going to be the salvation because they weren't sectarian and they were well trained, the Interior Ministry is apparently saying, sorry, we're, we're just not going to suit them up. So, well, I mean, a, the, the, the thing a, is sliding that, beyond the well, coherent be, influence well, of the no, Bush that, Ministry. That might be our, at our behest. I mean, there's an interesting piece by, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Roel Mark Gerecht yeah. in the Wall Street Journal about how. The Iraqification policy has been a disaster because we've basically armed a bunch of Shiite sectarians who are then going to engage in revenge killings. Uh, our, our horse there is the army, not the police. So if the Interior Ministry f uh, refuses to field the police, that might be a sensible uh, second thought on behalf of, of our leaders who, who don't want the police running around killing a bunch of Sunnis no, and would rather that's, have that's the army take care of we, we have put a lot of resources into training the police they're refusing to field. Um, I thought they wanted more arms so they could go out and kill some more Sunnis. Well, they, they may want the arms, but they don't want these particular people who have been holed up in American yeah. training camps. For you know, yeah. okay. um, they want uh, their own folks out there, and they've got them, I guess. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't know. Are, are you uh, are you less optimistic? Uh, I, I'm not less optimistic. I wasn't very optimistic to begin with. It, it does seem to me the one thing we've learned is that these sectarian fissures are very deep, and the idea that if only we had done the Iraq war right, which is what uh, the position a lot of people are taking, uh, that it all would have worked out, uh, is sort of a fiction, a convenient fiction for people who were for the war to say, well, I was for the war and I was right to be for the war, but that darn Bush just screwed it up. Uh, obviously, these are things, as John Burns has said, that would have happened uh, with the war regardless of how well it was carried out. And it's just a question of whether the sectarian fissures are so strong that they can't be overcome. Uh, but well, even I would concede. I thought the war was a mistake in the beginning. Even right. I would concede that 
we'll never know whether it could have worked out better because certainly things would be different if the Bush administration had done a lot of things differently. But, but I, I agree. I mean, the, the, the neocon line the, that it kind of definitely would have worked if not for Don Rumsfeld or something is a, is a little too simple. And, and it seems more and more simplistic the more we learn about about the history of some of these divisions, not just between the sects, but but in, uh, within uh, the sects. Hmm. But there's some divisions that were to our advantage. The division between the uh, Iranian Shiites and the Iraqi Shiites is a good thing because it means that Ayatollah Sistani is, is resisting completely becoming a pawn of Iran and that also uh, there is there's much more uh, willingness to undertake democracy among the Iraqis than, than exists in Iran. So, uh, anyway, it, 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 you know, Josh Marshall's analogy of, of you know, this, there was this all these fissures and they were going to spring open like a steel trap once you took the lid off is probably the accurate one, and, and that was going to happen whatever, you know, it, as, lo as long as we toppled Saddam, that was going to happen whether or not we disbanded the army or did all the things, all, made all the mistakes that we allegedly made. Uh, we'll never know. Um, and that's my final word on the subject. Uh, cool. Um, until the next time. The, uh, the next topic is... Uh, I forgot to ring the bell. Damn it. Okay. The next topic is uh, objectivity and subjectivity in journalism. Uh, this is actually a pretty tired subject. There, Kinsley wrote a very good piece in Slate on it, uh, where he sort of made the, the case that I've always uh, agreed with, which is uh, subjective journalism with a you know where you can't lie about the facts, but you have to defend a point of view, is actually more informative than objective journalism, where you have to hide your beliefs and therefore don't have to defend them. Uh, the, tr the trouble is, of course, uh, you wonder in, in a purely subjective sort of Internet-type world, uh, you know, who will report on the baseball scores? Uh, how, how That's you my great concern. How will you find out whether... No, but I mean, how, who will report on objective facts? In other words... Uh, either UCLA either did or didn't win last night. There's no subjective way to make it seem like they won. Uh, Osa, you know, Osama bin Laden either is or isn't dead. Uh, uh, you want reporters who will go find that out. Well, right, but there have been whole systems, like the British system of media, where I gather the media, the periodicals, were fundamentally partisan, and yet they reported on facts, and there was a certain range within which you could trust the facts, right? And this I gathered that in an earlier time in American history, newspapers were partisan, right? Yeah, but apparently that's not the case in Britain now. Apparently there are a few newspapers that are trustworthy, but most of them actually aren't because they don't care about the facts. They just care about pleasing their readers. Hmm. Uh, we had a, a, a British editor in, uh, sat in on a, on, a, on a Slate meeting just the other day who said, look, this idea that you can trust British newspapers is BS. There are a couple like the Financial Times... Uh, and maybe the Guardian that you can trust, but aside from that, uh, it's Katie bar the door, uh, and their standards just aren't up to American standards apparently in terms of like actually being faithful to the facts. I don't think American standards are all that high, so that's a pretty poor commentary if it's true. Well, there are actually two separate questions here. I mean, I mean, Kinsley cast his piece as kind of wither the newspaper if objective reporting is dead, but there's there's a second wither the newspaper question, and and the two are related, and and one is. Leaving aside objectivity versus subjectivity, is it possible that with the reporting of news could become a kind of ad hoc, virtual, in other words, for any given story, a kind of, uh, you, you see the kind of spontaneous assembly of a chain of information that gets the facts to you. So, for example, you know, people are out at, at the, one of these immigration ra rallies in L.A., and, and, and various people are... Uh, taking pictures of it with their with their uh, their cell phones and they're and they're uploading them to their little personal websites and anyone can link to them and and so bloggers become aware of them and you choose to link to the ones where you can see a bunch of Mexican flags and a a blogger of a different persuasion might not and that's where the ideology enters but 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 there is separately the question of whether the facts cannot cannot get to the the, the blogs. 
uh, in, in this kind of ad hoc way. And you know, some what? people would be doing little diary-like well, entries that, about what they see and so on. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good example. I mean, it seems to me that if you read the L.A. Times coverage of that march and then you read the blog coverage, you found you got a lot closer to the truth on, with the blog coverage. The L.A. Times suppressed the fact that there were any Mexican flags there at all. Uh, uh, you know, and, they, and, and it, it, you know, bloggers went back and forth as to how many there were, and there were photographs. You could count the Mexican flags in the photographs, and, you know, there were some photographs that were photographs of basically the whole crowd. Uh, they, they, you, it's hard to be selective, and eventually you sort of came to an assessment that, yeah, there were a lot of Mexican flags there, there were also a lot of American flags. Uh, and and it, that's a much clearer picture of what actually was going on than uh, than if you just read the L.A. Times, which was you know mm. uh, totally PC. Well, so, it seems and to also me, a monopoly. Also, you know, there's only one of it. It seems to me that to the extent that this kind of ad hoc news gathering process becomes viable, and it'll become viable as more and more people have camera phones and video, you know, camera phones. Uh, you know, increasingly, it'll be the case that, like, what are the chances that some actual credentialed journalist gets to the scene of anything before just citizens who have the capability to video stuff and upload it? Well, and, and so that's going to become more and more viable. And actually, if, if, if micropayments ever catch on on the web and we're waiting, um, then there will be an incentive yeah. for people like this to go, go in and interview, uh, you know, the parties yeah. involved in the news. And so, anyway, right. to the extent that all of that becomes more practical, then it does seem to me that the de-objectification of the news is more likely. Because in that world, I think what people do is they turn to their favorite bloggers, and their bloggers lead them to these grassroots, you know, freelance, amateur, quasi-amateur reporters right. uh, of the bloggers choosing. Right. What, 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 there are a couple of problems. First, you know, only so many people can interview Bill Frist, so, although Instapundit, I think, is one of them. But, uh, you know, so that, those, that, that universe is going to be fairly limited. So you're always going to need people who can do that good interview. Maybe some of them will be bloggers, but it will be a finite sort of, sort of select group. Uh, well, that, in a way, that doesn't matter because people like Bill Frist, all they say is what they want to say anyway. They might as well never show up in public and just put out press releases. Well, That's what they do when they show up on the that, PBS that, News that Hour. tends to be true, although there are probably some people who can worm interesting things out of Bill Frist, and Maureen Dowd is probably one of them. Occasionally, uh, but there are a whole other the, genres of news the, where there isn't that kind of monopoly on the, on the, right, on the right. information the, that the supplier The other big problem is investigative journalism, which is very expensive. You spend six months on a story and it falls through and somebody's got to, you know, you have to eat through while, while you're doing that. And my, uh, my friend Annie Bardak's idea, which I think is a good one, is uh, have universities fund that. Uh, you know, the newspapers aren't going to be able to afford to do it. They're already cutting back and they're going to go... In this model, they get put out of business by the by the internet anyway. Uh, somebody's got to fund that. We want at least we want somebody to fund that. The logical people to do that are universities. But it could also be that top, the need for top down investigative journalism declines as more and more you know whistleblowers and casual witnesses are empowered to get the facts they gather out there right away. Um, it's possible. It it's a real spontaneous investigative reporting or something. Investigative reporting, though, is a, is a I, mean, I can't do it. It's a real skill. So. Uh, well, yeah, but I'm saying that the part of the skill lies in unearthing these sources who actually, who, in whose interest it is to talk once they're unearthed. I'm saying they may be self-unearthing in, in the future uh, for technological reasons, but uh, that's as far as I want to... That's wanna, possible. Usually yeah. you have to suck up to them and betray them, though. Oh. That's a long process. Um, okay. Okay. Um, uh, John McCain. John McCain. Um, yeah, there was this. Uh, there's this video of McCain on uh, on Meet the Press that's right. on Crooks and Liars. Kevin Drum linked to it uh, and opined a that that uh, at least implicitly that it doesn't doesn't reflect well on or McCain didn't come off looking very good. And, and secondly, uh, Drum opined that that this whole business of uh, McCain is this fierce independent spirit has always been overblown. He's just another conservative. Um, did you did you watch the? I watched the interview. I, I completely disagree with Kevin. Uh, first, I thought you didn't think he came off well, did you? Yeah, I thought he came off fine. He's, I thought he looked incredibly defensive and petulant. No, I thought he looked. I thought he looked. Uh, 
given given the ferocity of Tim Russert's, you know, attack on him, it was uh, well, yeah. I mean, it, was, it wasn't the, good. The it was by virtue the, of the way Tim Russert came the, off. The, bullet, the bullishness. McCain kept his calm. He, you uh, know, the Republicans, the Republican base to which he's appealing isn't going to be annoyed that he. That he, uh, you know, kept his calm in the face of Russert. And, I wouldn't say he kept he his did, calm. There was an edge in his voice throughout. I mean, he didn't strangle him. Well, he he's didn't not, kill him. He's not used to Tim Russert being anything other than fawning to him. But he, I, I just didn't detect that. I didn't. I mean, he, there. He, 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 I bet he can get a lot more petulant than that. Uh, the second thing is, there's there's so much talk. I mean, that, this idea that. That now he's revealed as not a maverick. Well, he, you know, they were saying of. I keep remembering after the South Carolina primary uh, in in 2000, they were saying, "Well, Bush, he's so far to the right now, he doesn't have time to get back to the center to win the election. He's screwed." Uh, that was completely insane. There were, there were, there wasn't a light. You know, there wasn't one lifetime. There were 20 lifetimes before the general election. He had plenty of time to get back. The, the the, the what I call the filer faster thesis, the idea that politics move faster, means that there's much more time week to week than we used to think there was. So there's there's so much time for McCain to appeal to the base and and then you know reassert his maverick credentials well, uh, by the by the general election. That, well, that I don't think Kevin. Funny. I mean, I think Kevin Drum's argument was that his maverickness has just always been just over overstated as a, as a repertorial matter. Well, I, it's it's hard to. I mean, he, he, you know, he's he's stuck this torture thing up Bush's craw. He's uh, he's totally maverick on immigration, uh, even even like sort of against his own interests, maverick on immigration. Uh, he's he's the campaign he... finance reform he championed is is anathema to large parts of the Republican Party. I don't see. How you can argue that he's not genuinely a maverick? Why, why do you think journalists so easily fall under his spell? I have a theory. Because journalists are sucker for candor or seeming candor, and he seems to be candid. I think there's that. I also think the fact that this generation of journalists, uh, which would include me, uh, are by and large people who didn't go to war, uh, and, and they're kind of in awe of somebody who a went to war and b was kind of a hero, you know, withstood torture stoically and 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 so on. I think that's that's part of McCain's charisma. Sure, that's part of it. But the the, the main thing is it is the the idea that he seems to actually be saying what he thinks, and even if you disagree with it, you respect him for that. He seems unlike Frist. He does not he does not seem to be uh, you know taking a a, a phony line. I mean, Frist is so inept that even when he's sincere, he makes it seem like he's taking a phony line. Uh, and you're right that the rest of the interview seem more phony, and, and but, you know, people are willing to... I, I, I don't think oh. that does him any long-term People should go watch it. He just looked extremely defensive uh, to me okay, and, well, and our, really our, put out, and we'll, in a way we'll, that he usually doesn't. We'll link to it, and our viewers can decide uh, for themselves. I thought he was placid in an almost Buddha-like way. <laughs> so... Yeah. The truth may lie somewhere in between. Maybe, and maybe I'm right and you're wrong. There's always that slim possibility. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. China. China. Uh, you had some point to make. Yeah, just a, kind of a little thing. Um, you know, uh, I guess I have a prediction, actually, about okay. China. The, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess... Um, well, well, some time ago, I don't know when exactly, two senators, uh, Lin Lindsey Graham and, and Chuck Schumer, um, sponsored a bill that would slap a hefty tariff on China in retaliation for its refusal to let its currency appreciate against the dollar, mm -hmm. which, of course, would itself have the effect of reducing uh, American imports of Chinese goods. Then these two senators went over to China a week or so ago and came back and said that they had put this so-called nuclear option on the shelf for the time being. And the sense that people got was that China uh, had, had the Chinese leaders had reassured them, okay, un under you know under under this kind of threat, we will do something. Trust us in, in the coming months that we will let our currency appreciate. Uh, and the idea was that the nuclear option had worked. Um, I predict, and I, and I base this on this New York Times piece that I'll talk about, I, I predict that actually the, the Chinese currency will appreciate over the next year appreciably, 
um, but that it will become increasingly clear that it didn't have anything to do with this nuclear option. And uh, the reason for that is this New York Times piece a couple days ago about how in China uh, wages are getting bid up, workers are scarce, um, increasingly uh, you're seeing the development of a Chinese middle class. A lot of it's very good news. Uh, but one thing it means is that uh, you can expect inflationary pressures to be building up in China, and the way China will naturally export its inflation is to let its currency appreciate. So I think uh, that, that what's happening is we're just entering a phase where China more and more will see the appreciation of its currency as being in its, in its interest to, to, to help its economy um, cool down a little, uh, to, to, to make its good, you know, to, to, to actually, you know, keep its exports from rising so fast that, that they continue and, to bid up wages and so on. And, and, the, and the lesson we should draw from that is the traditional Bob Wright lesson that the United States should never attempt to throw its weight around anywhere because it's always counterproductive and it never has a good effect. Um, actually, that's not what I was planning to say. <laughs> but... Uh, 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 and I'm not sure I'd be willing to, because it really wasn't the U.S. I mean, it wasn't the executive branch that was throwing its weight around. Uh, well, presumably the executive branch was happy that Schumer and Graham were out there yeah. making it their noises. It wouldn't have bothered me if the threat had worked uh, as a threat, but if they had delivered, it would have bothered me. I would be against the tariffs, absolutely. And, and, and there is a question of how, how credibly you can use a threat if you're not going to deploy it. So. Right. If the idea was to actually to actually uh, I mean, deploy the threat, uh, yeah, I'd be against that. I mean, I mean my to the extent that it, I mean, my the moral I would like to draw is that uh, basically uh, the free traders are turning out to be right in a way sooner than I thought, even in that. Although, yes, in the in the short term, you definitely uh, there are definitely American workers who are hurt by free trade, no doubt about it. But in the long run, and, in, and now it's looking like in the medium run, uh, one thing you see is that a middle class starts to develop in China. They will be importing things from other countries. Uh, and moreover, as their wages rise, they become less of a competitive threat to American workers. Now, of course, what happens next is the factories move to Vietnam and India right, and places exactly. that, that will have relatively low wages. And I admit that it takes a long time before the entire world's wages get bid up. Uh, but it's happening a lot faster than we thought. In China, I had not expected to see this story this pretty, soon. And, and, was, and, and the data, although kind of consistently anecdotal, uh, I thought was convincing. Yeah, no, no, I agree. That was a very a very important and amazing story, uh, that they're running out of workers in China. I guess if you have a one-child policy, eventually that, that catches up to you. Now, that's another very uh, interesting thing that came out, is, is that that's one thing that, that's happening, is that the... the the one-child policy was start, is a little over a couple decades old, I think. So all these only children are just kind of leaving college, entering the workforce. And it's interesting to see what's going to happen now because uh, one thing about them is that they are very heavily invested in by their parents. So they're very right. well-educated by and large. Right. They're not interested in doing menial work uh, for, for low wages. Right. And it'll be interesting to see what the effects of that are. In a way, you can imagine China in 10 or 20 years kind of being like the U.S., except without the working class, right. almost. I mean, having... No, I think that ultimately the, China, the threat from China is not that they will outproduce us on the factory floor, but they will outthink us in the universities, and they're just... They're going to produce so many brilliant people that their colleges will be better than our colleges. Yeah, well... Uh, uh, they will be producing a lot of, what did Robert Rice used to call them, symbolic analysts? He, he stupidly called them symbolic analysts when they're really symbol analysts, yes. But, but Bob, you can't, it, it, all that's true, but it's still true that the effect of trade is to, uh, to, to make wages very low for unskilled American workers. In order to make a good middle class income in America now, you need skills, which means the income is stratified by education and smarts, which means it has sort of a more evil, insidious cast than it did before when you could be unskilled, go to work for Detroit, and make, uh, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 So uh, trade has had, uh, is, you know, I'm, I'm for free trade, but it definitely is not, it's not like it doesn't have uh, pernicious effects. Even if we prosper, it has those pernicious effects because people who are unskilled and not smart don't make a lot of money in a free trade regime. 
Uh, I think that's true. I mean, there's no doubt that in the short run, American workers uh, sometimes find themselves in a zero-sum game with foreign workers. But aren't you kind of surprised that given how much uh, cheap labor has suddenly come online in the, in the global economy, that the effects haven't been worse in America in a way? I mean, I, I guess, I mean, income inequality, what, is, slight, is slightly growing now? And, but the well, unemployment the, the, the rate news. is not very high. No, right. And, and, and I guess the, 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 the lesson there is that uh, there's still enough, uh, enough jobs that have to be performed in America that the low-wage market can be tight. Uh, which is why it seems to me we have to prevent it from being swamped by immigrants. But, uh, but yes, the, 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 uh, the conventional wisdom is that uh, income inequality is still growing, but only at the top. In other words, it, 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 during, the, during the 90s, the whole income structure was pulled apart. I get this from Gary Bertlis, who's a smart labor economist at Brookings. The whole income structure was pulled apart. Uh, you know, middle-class workers made more than lower wage workers, uh, but that sort of stopped at the end of the Clinton era, and now it's just that the rich are getting richer. So, uh, so, so you're saying, A, workers in, say, the 30th percentile of income, A, they're not losing income in real terms, their wages aren't dropping in real terms, and B, they're not, fa they're not falling relative to, say, workers in the 70th percentile income percentile? I think that's right. I think that that, that I may be wrong, and maybe I'll have to correct this, but it seems, I think that the, the bottom 90 percent of the income uh, is basically frozen static, not doing anything. Well, but, in any event, but the, I think, the top um, is exploding. I, I also think, I mean, you know, if you think long term about the problem of terrorism, you know, the, the goal does have to be in the long term that you bring kind of the whole world online, um, and, and that's one reason we can't really retreat from free trade, although I would like to see more trade directed you know, to to the areas that are the likely trouble spots in that regard, yeah. like the but Arab world and Africa. I, I thought you were going to say this is a vindication for the Bob Wright worldview because it shows that uh, labor standards worldwide can rise fairly quickly. Uh, so that there's 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 you know. Well, I, that, it's actually the, the article did note that 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 some companies are increasing benefits, not just wages. Right. But I have never been opposed. There's two things I've never been opposed to. One is using the World Trade Organization to lift uh, labor standards upward, although I would want to s start fairly humbly with goals like uh, making, uh, guaranteeing the right to uh, bargain collectively everywhere. B, I've never been opposed to these kind of non-governmental forms of regulation where NGOs certify uh, goods as coming from factories that, you know, have working right. bathrooms and stuff. I... I, I those two things are, are fine with me, and, and right. Okay, so I, yeah. So you you're, you're not just for letting the market work. You're for no, no. I uh, I, 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 I just think increasingly that regulation to be effective will need to move beyond the national level to the regional or global level. All right. Okay. Um, if we have any viewers left after a discussion of international trade and uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a pretty and, and sober currency, uh, dialogue. Currency fluctuations. That's always a crowd pleaser. So. Um, it's uh, it's what pushes my buttons. Well, so we're going to do viewer email now? Yeah, and I haven't read it, so you're going to, I think, Kate, uh, 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 propose. First of all, okay, a couple, and then, uh, okay, first of all, Paul I. from San Antonio, where I went to high school, heard me assert without foundation that uh, if you, you know, we could police the borders with the troops in Iraq, you know, that you could line them up and they'd be able to see each other all the way along the 2,000 miles. He actually did the math, assuming 40-hour work week, uh, you know, so you'd have three shifts per day, two weeks vacation. I mean, he did the math and concluded that I was actually correct. They, they would uh, they'd be about 100 yards apart. Thank you, Paul. Now, Mickey, Nick writes with this question, do you and Robert Wright actually like each other at all? At times I get the impression that one or the other of you would like to reach through your camera and strangle the other. If you two are friends, you don't seem like it, at least as far as I can tell. Mickey? Well, I, th I, I was kind of annoyed with you this morning, but I think, uh, I don't think it's a deal breaker. So, uh, um, so basically it's, he's it's on the right, he's on to something here. No, basically, it's you that want to strangle me. I, I maintain a, a Pacific calm throughout. 
Now, so this gets to the next thing that he said, Mickey, which is really what got my go. Has Mr. Wright been channeling Mr. Spock? Does he have emotions at all? Everybody thinks you have no emotions. They're just not detecting the subtle irony and the subtle signals. Especially, uh, I continue reading, especially positive emotions such as joy or warmth. Are his facial muscles capable of smiling? Now, Mickey, the idea that I would be less evidently warm than you, I mean, I don't, I don't notice a lot of warmth bubbling up from your soul, right? Well, I'm not as... Uh, you're just heavily into this, this uh, postmodern ironic mode. Uh, you know, uh, formerly the laconic cowboy mode, where there, you don't. Now you're getting you my cultural roots. It's you from don't, West Texas. You don't wear you don't wear your heart on your sleeve, and uh, I do claim that I have a little more, uh, you know, a little more old school schmaltz. But uh, I have been more vividly emotional than you have. That's true. But on occasion, not in, a positive I mean, in terms way. of the extremes reached, but not in a positive way. I have way. come close to actually cracking on the air. <laughs> anyway, don't we want to get to the mottos? Oh, the mottos. You just, you know. Okay. And yeah, have, this is the we motto have, We've asked our readers to submit mottos for blogging heads TV. Mugs and T-shirts and things. Yeah. Uh, Aaron S suggests blah blah blogging heads. Uh, Aaron, I'm afraid that one's not going anywhere. David Z, in a world at loggerheads, watch Blogging Heads TV. Ooh. I like the cinema. It's a little Close. wordy. Close, but yeah, no, that, that, that is the right spirit. Yeah, okay. We're bringing America together. We have Byron York and David Corn. Right. And they're talking to each other. Right. It's so moving. And I'll get back to that theme of, 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 of bringing the world together later in the, in, in, as we go through more of these. Um, Nathan B., Blogging Heads TV, die of vlogging a dead moose. Like vlogging a dead moose, like vlogging a... <laughs> you like it. No, I admire the spirit. I don't think it quite works, but... I admire the spirit, too. Uh, uh, Bob M. Just too complicated. Blogging Heads TV, asymptotically approaching clarity. I like the idea. No, I like that idea, too. Because it, it's always been my theory that... Now tell me if I should write any of these down as finalists. Have you heard anything that merits that yet? Not quite. Not quite. Uh, David H. Heads will blog. I mean, in general, that we probably shouldn't have blogging heads in there because it's going to say blogging heads TV and then say something else, and you'd probably right. like to, not to be too too phonetically redundant there. Right. Um, right. 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 I wish I could quit you. You know. I like the idea of people getting addicted to the site. Right. Jake, uh, Jake W. writes in, Diavlog killed the written blog star, you know, a reference to... Yeah, 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 video killed the radio right. star. Um, uh, like the spirit, but I don't, gonna, I don't think it's going to kill the written blog Paul star. Paul W. suggests we give great blogging heads. Paul, it's a family <laughs> show. It's a family show. Yeah, but Paul was... also suggests... And this, I take, is really a variation on Diavlog Me. And, and I think if this one, we would give credit to the originator, the, 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 the submitter of Diavlog Me. Diavlog Bat! Exclamation point. Again, you have a, a, a rhythmic parallel with a known phrase. You know what that phrase is, Mickey? Movie uh, title? Analyze uh, that? Analyze that. But Diavlog that, that. Except it's called Analyze This. Is it? I think. But anyway... Diavlog. Oh, there were actually two, I think. I think there was yeah. a sequel, maybe. maybe. Diavlog Me is looking better and better in retrospect. You like it better than Diavlog That or Diavlog yes. This? Yeah, because it has the sexual component. Yeah, but uh, I'm wondering how many people are going to want to wear that T-shirt for that very reason. I mean, you can imagine, you know... You underestimate the coarsening of American culture. Of course they're going to wear that. But we're against the coarsening of American culture. People, people wear T-shirts to say FCUK. So they're going to... That's, I'm against that. Di Diavlog Me is nothing. No, I that's, will not abet the coarsening of American that's, culture. That's the new clean. I like Dirty is the new now, clean. But anyway, uh, here's one that inspired me. First of all, this guy, John M., says, I'm going to assume that since at least one of you is a free marketer, you are incentivizing my efforts, free shirt or mug, if you use my motto. Uh, I think John M. has uh, got us mixed up with somebody else, Mickey. Um, uh, but although Charlie, I was thinking maybe you could uh, a, a, a free autograph copy of your book, The End of Equality, wouldn't be a bad prize for the ultimate winner. It, it, surely, if we if we do do a sell T-shirts, we can give the winner a T-shirt. Yes. 
No, I like I like the yearbook idea. But anyway, uh, John M. proposes making politics interesting one dialogue at a time, which spurred this thought in me: saving the world one dialogue at a time. Now you probably won't like that. I don't mind. It just it fits in with your megalomaniacal mess messianic complex. Precisely. So whereas, you, would, you, whereas would like you are indifferent to the fate of humanity. So I, I was pretty sure you wouldn't like saving I, the world one dialogue at a time. But I'm writing it down. I have one foot in Jim Pickard and spaceship. Yeah. He's indifferent because he's 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 got a plan yeah, that's B. A, there are going to be about three people who fit in that. Uh, so uh, my theory is that you know first we're going to build all these spaceships to escape Earth, and then we're going to you know fill the first one with the Bin Laden family, and then there's not going to be any room for the rest of us. But Wow. It's a, it's a joke. Never wow. mind. Okay. Uh, so, look, I, I, I'm afraid we've come to the end. We didn't read nearly all of them. I mean, a lot came in. That was, that was at most... That was the that cream was of the half. crop? Um, I am personally... Remember, there was... It's time to deploy the moose. That, that's okay. You like uh, that. I like saving the world one dialogue at a time. And dialogue, right? You say me, not that? Yes. Well, so for the time being, I mean, should we... I, I keep... blog me, you blogging head, you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think at this point, maybe we should take the discussion offline, Mickey. Um, God, you're such a prude. I am. I, hey, I've got kids. It's like you have daughters or something. I yeah. know. Um, so those three, and I think we can, in principle, make all three available, right? Well, those would certainly be the winners. I think we should hold out for at least another tranche of... Submissions, because we got a lot last time. It was a very good response. Yeah, but at and some point, you know, we got to pull the trigger here. But that point is not now. You don't think so? I don't think so. I think we can milk it for one more thing. Okay. Okay. Well, but I would say make sure they're good. Yes. So that's my advice to submitters. Yes. Because there's a there's a lot of paperwork we're talking about right now. Though the the, the semifinalists are, it's time to deploy the moose. Saving the world one dialogue at a time, and dialoguing. Correct. Okay. I'm glad we got that taken care of. Uh, we're incredibly efficient. That's us. Okay. So we're. Uh, uh, I will see you next time. All right. Okay. Bye. See ya.